All right, welcome back. So, I don't have a lot to do today. Uh, I have some stuff that we can talk about. Uh, we can go over some problems together, but my main goal today is to answer questions and get you guys ready for the midterm on next week, Tuesday. Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so, let me just talk a little bit about the midterm to get us started. So, this is kind of, you know, an important point in the semester. Starting on Monday, we're going to start talking about some, some new ideas and new material. Um, these imperative programming ideas, however, these building blocks that you guys have been learning over the last four weeks, are not going away. They're going to be part of um, sort of what we do when we talk about objects, which we're going to do starting on Monday. And then when we get to the third unit of the class and we talk about data structures and algorithms, we're still going to be relying on these ideas. So this is a really important point to make sure that we're all on the same page together. And that's really how I see the midterm. That's the, the focus of this particular midterm in this class, is to make sure this is a checkpoint. So this is our chance to make sure that you guys are ready to succeed throughout the rest of the semester. This is a rough point in the semester. I understand that. I was talking about that with the CAs this week. We've thrown a lot at you guys uh, pretty quickly. Um, this week's quiz was hard. You guys did, I want to point out though, you guys did as well as last semester's class on the quiz this week. So, I mean, you guys are keeping up with where I want you to be. Some of you probably did less well than you would have liked. And if that's you, then I would say that's a little bit of a wake-up call for next week's midterm. Spend more time reviewing the practice problems. Come to office hours next week, get some help. Make sure that this stuff is really solidified. We're going to keep giving you guys more practice. So, again, the, the course is sort of cumulative in the sense that these imperative programming ideas keep coming back. We're going to keep using them. We're going to write more loops. We're going to write more conditional expressions. We're going to write a lot more functions. We're going to start structuring our code in different ways when we talk about objects. And we're going to start solving more interesting problems using some new techniques when we start talking about data structures and recursion and more about algorithms later in the class. But, but these building blocks that we've set you up with underlie everything. And so it's critical that we make sure that you guys have this solid. That's what this midterm is about. So this is our chance to make sure. If you get through this midterm, if you do okay in the midterm, you are going to be okay. We're gonna do well in this class. Again, the people that get to the end in this class, and, and there's a lot of people that do, do well. Now if it was up to me, you know, you know, what's the point of getting a C in a class like this? What does that mean? To me, it means like, well, you sort of know the material. It's like you sort of know how to program. There are like some programs you can write. Like, that's not what I want. If, if it's up to me, this class would be binary, like pass, fail. If you get it or you don't. If you don't, come back next semester, we'll try again. If you do, you're ready to move on. But I'm happy to give out lots and lots and lots of high grades in this class. That's what we do. If I'm confident that you know the material and you're ready to go on and succeed in 126, 173, 225, wherever you go after this. Um, you know, half learning. It's like, what does it mean to half learn how to drive a car? There's like some roads you can drive on and some you can't. Like, I sort of know how to ride a bike. What does that mean? Like, I'm going to fall down every 10 feet or something? I mean, this is a skill. Once you learn it, you know it. Some of you may take longer to solve problems. Some of you may get them more quickly. But I want you to know how to do it. That's my goal. OK, so here's how the midterm works. It's just like a quiz. In fact, this semester, the midterm is just like a quiz. There's only one difference, which is that you can't drop it. It's worth the same amount of credit, but you cannot drop the midterm. If you don't take the midterm next week, you will get a zero on the midterm. Okay, so this is not the time if you miss your reservation in the CBTF, contact them immediately, uh, schedule a time to make it up. But on next Friday, we're going to release the questions that were on the midterm. We're going to go on with life. At that point, if you come back a week later, it's like, whoops, there was that quiz last week I didn't take. Like, what was that all about? Um, yeah, so that's, that's going to be too late. But, but in many ways, this is exactly like a, a quiz. The multiple choice questions on the midterm are not going to be like these little conceptual, you know, like what's the keyword that I used for a loop or whatever. It's going to be more about code reading. So there'll be 12 of those. And then we have three programming questions for you. Uh, one's going to use arrays. It's another one that's going to use multidimensional arrays. The third one will be on strings. And here's something I'm going to promise you. The goal of our quizzes and midterms is to get you to do the homework problems. So 
one of the questions on the exam will be drawn from a previous homework problem or something that appeared on a previous exam. I will promise you that. I'm not going to tell you which one, but one of the questions is something that you will have seen already. It's up there on the homework 125 problem set right now, waiting for you to practice it. So that is the way to prepare for the midterm. Questions? About format. What do I mean by code reading? So these are the type of question where we'll give you a little block of code and then ask you a question about it. Yeah. So like, what is this piece of code trying to do? Or, you know, what's the value of that variable at a particular line or whatever? You guys have seen these already on the quizzes. These should not be unfamiliar to you. It's not the kind, again, it's, it's not the kind of question of like, you know, what's the name of the variable in that, you know, that's been declared? We were past that now, right? You guys can do more than that. Other questions? The term format. Okay, so let's do a little warm-up problem. This is the kind of thing that we really, um, you know, again, this is the kind of problem by now I would expect you guys to be uh, pretty comfortable with. So I'll give you an array. I want you to sum the values. I'll give you maybe, you know, 30 seconds to do this. Um, write a little snippet. Actually, I want, to write you, I want you to write a function called array sum. It takes an int, uh, an int array and sums the values. So take 60 seconds and uh, put that together, and then we'll go over it together. All right, who wants to get me started? How do I do this? What do I need to do first? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's declare our function first. So I've got this static thing I have to throw in front of things in the slide examples. Uh, this uh, example here, if you look at what I'm printing, I'm clearly expecting you to write a function called array sum, that a function to, should take and we could call this values, we could call it to sum, maybe we'll call it to sum. The description of what I'm about to do with that array. So I need a, an integer variable that's gonna store my sum. Now what am I gonna do? Yeah. Oh, okay, we'll come, let's come back to this. Let's do, but that's, that's not bad thinking. So the question was check for null. Yeah, but let's, let's just go on and do this first and then we'll come back and do our error checking in a minute. What do I do now? Yeah. Make a for loop. So this is a place where I could use my old enhanced for loop if I wanted to. So I don't care about the index inside this loop. I have to be able to type. Inside the loop, I'm going to add the value. Turn the value when I'm done. Let's see if this works. It seems to work for... Um, a nice simple example, it's going to return zero if the array is empty, but somebody, what somebody mentioned is what happens if I pass null? Yeah, now, now I've got a problem. So if we expect you to handle the null input, a couple of reminders here. So null, and this will make more sense next week, but null is a value that I can use whenever I have an object in Java. Strings are objects, but Arrays in Java are also objects. So I can pass a null reference to a function that's expecting an array. So I have to be able to handle that. Now it's not, you know, the, the semantics of what to do with null depend on the problem. 
So if we expect you to handle no, we'll say that, and we'll also tell you what to do. What's, what's a reasonable thing to do here? If I have a null array, yeah. Right, so I can check if the array is null, but what should I return? Zero, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, a null array doesn't really have a sum. But for the purposes of this, let's say if to sum is equal to null, I'll return zero. That way I'm protecting myself against this problem. Now I can handle null. Again, what to do with null, what the answer is if I pass you null. Um, later in the class, we'll talk about better ways to deal with inputs like this that are, that are really sort of invalid, right? It doesn't make any sense to sum a null array. It doesn't exist. Um, so its, it's sum is sort of undefined. In this case, I'm going to return zero just to make this safe so they can handle null, uh, but the right thing to do with null depends on the problem itself. Okay, good. So this is, you know, this is familiar. Questions about this before we go on? Okay. So, something from our homework problem. Um, I want to show you sort of how to do this. Um, there were, you know, when we watch you guys do this, these, one of the reasons we do the homework, one of the reasons why we like when you guys are asking for help is we get to see kind of how you guys are approaching problems and, and some sort of common misconceptions about things. So this was a homework problem, I think, last week or maybe earlier this week. Uh, we saw lots of great solutions to this problem, and we saw some solutions that were a little convoluted, shall we say, right? So, so one thing that at least a few uh, people seemed to think that they needed to do was once you check for null, go through the strings character by character, looking at the two characters. I mean, strings internally are an array of characters. I know how to get an array of characters out of them. Or, you know, um, I could just look at the string documentation and realize that strings have a method that might be helpful. That method is, you know, so if I, if I start, let's say I start Googling in here, I say equals, um, Okay, that's content equals. So this, this looks, compare the string to the specified object. Let's try that. Okay, so now I'm writing another function here called r equals. I'll give you guys 60 seconds to work on this. Quickly, I'm passing two strings to this function. Why don't we handle the case where neither one of the strings is null first, and then we'll add the null checks later. Take a few seconds, work on this problem. What's the function signature here? You can give me that. What's the name of the function? Yeah. R equals, what does it return? It's a Boolean. What are its arguments? Got two strings. Let's start with that. Again, I have to throw a static in front of here. That will go away next week. R equals, spell that right. I've got a string first and a string second. Those reasonable variable names for those strings, you know, like here, they're really just, there's nothing special about either one, so I might as well just use names that identify them. And if I know that neither are null, this is a very easy function to write. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use that equals method that both of these strings have. I could do second that equals first, but I'm going to do first that equals second, just because it reads nicer to me. So let's see if this works. Okay, so it looks like um, it compares strings properly when they're equal. It looks like it ignores white space, which is correct, and also handles the case where strings are different. All right, so, so now I've got this, so, so this works, but now I've got to do some 
what we call input validation. Because I probably, if I was writing this as a homework problem, would warn you that either one of these strings could be null. So how do we check for that? So once I know that both strings are not null, I can use the code that I already have here. That's what I can do once I get to that point. But I need to stick a little bit of extra logic at the top of the function. Someone who hasn't contributed yet, yet today. Yeah. Over on the right. Yeah. Okay, so let's see here. So let's say if first is, is null or second is null, return false. So now I'm going to be able to handle cases with null properly. I can handle the case where the second argument is null. I can handle cases where the, both arguments are null. And I can handle cases where the first argument is null. But if the, what about if I want to return true if the two strings are null, are both null? What if I want to say, well, if the strings are both null, then they are kind of equal to each other. Well, how do I handle that case? Yeah, and someone who hasn't spoken up. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, and, and this, is, this is kind of critical. Let's see. If first is equal to null and second is equal to null, then I'm going to return true. And you can put this as an else if, or you can put it as an if. It doesn't matter. When you have an if statement with a return inside of it, an else if works the same as just another if statement below it. Because if I get into that branch, I'm not going on. Right? So there's no way for me to hit that other else statement. So now if both of the strings are null, then I enter the first branch. If both of them are, if either one of them is null, then I'm going to get into the second branch because either I need to know that either the first is true or the second is true. If I drop through that conditional, I know that neither one of the strings is null. Because if they were both null, I would have returned true already on line three. If either one was null, but the other one wasn't, I would have returned false on line five. So by the time I get to line seven, I know that both of them are non-null. One suggestion I would make uh, one thing that seems to be popular, and I understand why people are doing this, is to do something like this. And this is fine. This works. My preference, as someone who's done this for a while, is not to do this. Um, instead, it's to do what I had before, which is I do my input validation at the top, and then What I know is that if I get to line seven, both of the strings are non-null. And I can do anything else I want in my function knowing that I can use the methods of first, I can use the methods of second safely because both of those strings are non-null. One of the reasons for this is that when you put things inside an else statement, it starts to push things out towards the margin. So if I have one, let's say I have one check, and then I have another check, and I have another check. If I keep putting those inside else statements, pretty soon my code has been indented two or three or four times, and it's becoming very hard to read. Lines start to get too long. I have to wrap them around. Um, so in this case, when someone's reading this, they're going to read that top part. They're going to say, OK, well, by the time I get to line seven, I know that um, neither string is null. And that's kind of my, that's my default setting. That's what I want. The rest of my code, whatever I'm doing with those two strings, I could have this function do other things, right? The um, error checking that I'm doing from lines two to six is really general purpose. This is general purpose error checking that checks whether or not uh, either string is null, right? And by the time I get to line seven, I know that I have two good inputs that I can do anything else I want. Okay, questions about this before we go on? It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Good. Okay, let's do some harder stuff. Oh, one of our favorite problems this semester. String rotations. So here's a variant on the string rotation problem that we've already done. And this one is harder. Doesn't seem like it should be harder, but it is harder. You'll see why in a minute. So 
What I want to do here is I want to take a function, and I want to use it to rotate a string left. So we've done a right rotation. Now we're going to do a left rotation. So the arguments are the same. I get a string as my first argument, and I get an int as my second argument. And my goal is to try to rotate that string left um, by the specified number of characters rather than right. And so the algorithm here is not that different. Now you can u do this using substring, but let's do it using an array of characters because I think that's more useful uh, for preparing you guys for the midterm. So this is not that different from what I did when I rotated right, if I solved the problem this particular way. So I create a new character array of the same size as the input, then I'm going to go through the input string character by character, and in each step, what I do is I take a character from the input string, and I put it into the right spot in the new string, the new array of characters. And then when I'm done, I return a string that's created from uh, the new array. Okay? So I copy, the, I copy the characters one by one from the old string into the rotated string, and when I'm done, I should have the rotated string. So let's, let's work on this one together. So I'm going to create a function called rotate left. And this takes a string and a, I'm going to call this rotation. All right, so I need to do, let, let's do some input validation before we start this time. So what are the, some of the things I need to check for here? Trying to create defensive programmers here. What's one thing I should check for? Yeah. If the string is null, what do you guys think I should do if the string is null? I'd probably just return null. Yeah. There's no way to rotate a null string. So before I get started, let's check to see if input is null. If it is, I'll just return null. There are some other things I can check for here. There are some other uh, ways that I can get away without doing much work. What are some cases where I'm already done? Somebody who hasn't spoken up yet. Yeah, what do you think? Well, okay, yeah. So if, if the, the rotation is the same number as the number of characters, or what? It's zero. But let's check that in a minute, actually. Um, yeah, but what else? There's a couple of strings here that are very easy to rotate. Yeah. Well, if it's empty, there's another string that's very easy to rotate. There's a string that is trivial to rotate. An empty string is easy to rotate, but there's another one that's trivial to rotate. The other one that's trivial to rotate is any string that has, yes? Has what? The same characters, but it's good too hard to check for that. It's something that's very easy to check for. A string with one character, indeed. Yeah, so let's say if input.length dot length is less than or equal to one, then I'm just going to return it. I don't need to do anything. Done. Now notice here on line five, I know that I can use dot length. Why? Because I've already checked for null on line two. So by the time I get to line five, I know it's safe to call the methods that input that this string provides because I've already made sure that that string is not null. Okay, so if the length is less than or equal to one, I'm just going to return it. Okay, so I've, I've handled my, um, let's come back and we'll talk about that rotation special case in a minute. But I've, I've handled the ones where I think, um, I think this is sort of an obvious case where I don't have to do much work. So now let's write my loop. So now I'm going to go through my string. I'm going to say, um, i is less than input dot length, i plus plus. Oh, I also said I need to create a new character array to store the, the values in. So let's do, I'm going to call this rotated string is equal to new care input dot length. So on line eight, I'm declaring and allocate in a new character array called rotate string, rotated string, sorry, um, of the correct size. So the rotated string is the same size as whatever my input is, so that's how I create. One, you know, suggestion, I, I know that, we, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the semester, but maybe it's actually starting to come and hit you, and hit you guys, is that use good names for your variables. 
it's so much easier to figure out what's going on. Even in a little piece of code like this. This is not a large piece of code. But if I call the rotated string array rotated string, and if I call the string input, then it's very hard to get mixed up as I'm starting to manipulate them. If I call them A and B, or first and second, or one variable, another variable, then it's easy to get mixed up because I have to remember what that mapping is. Oh, A is the input and B is the new rotated string. No, don't do that. Just call it rotated string. Trust me, like you, you, you have many, many characters left in your fingers um, in, in your life, and you should use them to make your life easier when you're solving problems like this. Okay. So for now, let's just, what we're going to focus on is figuring out how to compute the correct new position for each index. That's the tricky bit here, okay? So for now, let's just make sure that, and this has to return a string, so I'm just going to return the empty string for now, okay? Oh, there's something that's angry with me about something. Oh, yes, sorry. This should be inside. Bingo. Thank you. Yes. So I'm calling the result of calling rotate left, and I can see now I'm going through the string. This is good. And let's, let's rotate this left by one. Okay. So the character at index zero in the string, where should it end up? in the new string if I'm rotating it left by one character and the string is of length five? What's the correct answer here? So it's at zero, it's gonna go left one, it can't go to negative one, so it has to wrap around, so it ends at the end. The end is which index? Four. Okay, so let's try to get there. So I'm gonna say rotated index is equal to I and now let's do minus rotation. So what's that going to give me here? Negative one. Now here's the problem in Java. I'm going to, I'm going to make you guys sad because in many other programming languages, what's the one other piece of information that I know that I have to use in this computation? Clearly the new position depends on the current position it depends on the amount that I'm supposed to rotate, and then what's the one other piece of information? The length of the string. This is another way to think about these computations. If you haven't used all of the pieces of data that you know are important, you know that where it goes depends on how long the string is. You know that where it goes depends on the current index. You know that where it goes depends on how much I ask you to rotate by. So there's this one more piece of information that we haven't used yet. And we're going to use it as a modulus. We're going to use it to keep my index in bounds. So I'm going to say mod input dot length. Now again, if this was Python, we'd be done. Because in Python, this operator is a modulus. And negative one mod five is four. But this is Java. So we're going to find ourselves disappointed. Let's see what happens here. So I'm going to print system.out.println i I find myself disappointed by that first value. The rest of them are right. Right? For 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm actually uh, computing the right index, but the first one's wrong. Why? Again, negative one mod five is four. But what this prints is negative one. Why is that? Yeah. In Java, this operator is not a modulus. It's a remainder. I hate that I have to talk about this so much, by the way. This, this is one thing I will not miss about Java. Um, so what it does is it computes the remainder if you divide it by that. And the remainder if you divide negative one by five is negative one. But there's a simple fix here. What do I need to do? I'm really close. So, so look, all of my other values are correct. There's just something I need to do here, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, so, so if I take the rotated, okay, so let's try that. So let's say, let's say uh, rotated index plus equals input dot length. So that's gonna make it correct for the first value, but now it's wrong for all the others. Okay, oh, okay, this is interesting. So you put it, you said to put it in here? Yeah. Okay, I like that idea. So that looks correct. Not sure it is correct though. I'm gonna try a different value here. Let's try rotate left by six. Yeah, I've got a problem again. I'm close, I'm getting close. This is not quite correct. So back to the drawing board. What do I need to do? Here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, th so the, the modulus or the remainder operator will bring the value in between 0 and 4 or between 0 and negative 4. But if it's negative, all I need to do is add that value back. So I say if rotated index is less than 0, Now, I'm good. So now this will work for six. I should get the same results for one. Let me try a different value. That also looks correct. So now I'm good. I have a little bit of work to do to finish the job. What do I have to do now? So now I'm correctly figuring out where the character comes from, where it goes. This is really most of the problem. But there's one last thing I have to do. Now that I've figured out the right place to take the character from and the right place to put the character, what do I do next? Yeah. Well, I've got to, but I've got to put it in my uh, character array, right? So I need to do, I need to do rotated string at rotated index is equal to input dot care at i. And now I'm going to say return. This is how I convert a character index back into a string. There we go. So does that look right? Let's see. So I've gone by three. So two should be the first character. That looks right. Two went one. Two went from position four to position one, and then everything else is in the right spot. If I'm testing this, what, what do I want to check? What are some other values here? Again, be an adversarial tester. What are some other values here? Yeah. What's that? Ooh, I like that. Let's try a negative number. So what is a left rotation by negative one? It's a right rotation by one. So what I'm hoping to see here is a right rotation by one. Look at that. That's pretty cool. What else? What's wrong with these, both of these values? I've chosen three and negative one. You guys aren't being adversarial enough. Give me, a, give me another value here, yeah. A hundred, yeah, I like that. Let's choose something big, something that actually would require me to flip things around a bunch of times. What's the right answer for a 100? Anybody know? The string has five characters in it. What's 100 divided by five? What's the remainder? So I should get same string. Yeah, let's do 101. So now that's equivalent to a left rotation of one. And this looks correct. All right, questions about that? David. Yeah, so this is now a right rotation. And it works. Yeah. Now, if I do a right rotation, I don't need... Well, actually, that's not true. Because now what this allows me to do, it just allows me to right rotate by negative values as well. 
So when we gave you this problem on the homework, we did not test negative values. And so you guys were able to get away with not doing this. But a right rotation by a positive value is equal to a left rotation by a negative value. A right rotation by a negative value is equal to a left rotation by a positive value. So we could have checked positive values and negative values, and those would, be, those would have forced you to handle this case. But this is now a general solution. And as David pointed out, the only thing that's different between the right rotation and the left rotation is that one sign inside the loop on line 10. If I add, I'm going right. If I subtract, I'm going left. OK, good. I'm going to leave this one behind. All right. Here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to, and we have enough time for this. Um, I'm going to quickly show you guys a couple of other ways to do this. Um, and, and these are correct, but they are not perfect. And I'm just going to quickly critique a couple of these. Now, um, this makes you feel uncomfortable, I want to point out. Um, first of all, all these are correct in the sense they pass the test cases for this homework problem. But again, I don't consider these perfect. So one of the things about this class that's a weakness that we are aware of is the fact that you guys can write code that's correct according to our test suites. But, you, but that code would never get you a job. And if you showed it to anybody in a job interview, um, like they would, I, I would be embarrassed for you, right? Um, I'm serious, right? Because you know, I'm, I'm going to show you some examples here you know, that, are, that are just limited, shall we say. Right? They, and, they, and sometimes they also reflect some conceptual misunderstandings. So the goal, of, again, the goal of this is not, you know, I'm, I'm, we're going to look at some examples from your semester. So it's possible that your code is going to be up here. Not on this problem, on the next one, right? Um, I'm not going to post these uh, because I don't want to disseminate bad solutions. Um, but I just want to say this, you know, um, for this example, I'm pulling stuff from last semester. So I'm going to embarrass some people from last semester. But my, but my goal here is, is really not to embarrass anybody, right? I just want to show you a better way to solve these problems and to help you understand, you know, again, if I was interviewing you and you solved the problem this way, showing you some of the misconceptions and some of the mistakes that I would see. OK. So let's do rotate right. So I've got here some code. OK. Let's go through this together. I'm going to get out my blinding laser pointer. I'm really not sure I should look directly at this thing. Um, OK. So again, this is correct. This code passed our test suite. But let me show you a couple of things that I, that I don't like about it. Um, so first of, all, first of all, this is very strange right here. right? So these two lines, what's happening here? So on line 12, I'm declaring a variable of type string called k. I don't know why it's called k. That's a, a pretty awful variable name. Um, and I'm using it to convert this new, this character array called new array into a string. And then I'm returning it. What can I do instead? This is one of those pieces of code that, that just, to me, highlights a really, really clear misconception. Yeah. Yeah. You can return this value directly. I don't need this variable at all. OK. OK, so that, that cleans that little bit up. What else, what else is, is, is weird about this? Um, let's see. So one thing that's happening is that I'm using my, so I, I, I allocate my new character array like that. I create this A shift. I don't know what that variable is. Um, so I take the shift value, and I, and I take the shift value, and I do a modulus there. Right. Then I have a loop over the input, which is correct. And here's the place where I'm computing my index. So this is, you know, so here, here's one clue that you're using the modulus operator wrong or the remainder operator wrong, if you have to use it twice. So it's being used once up here and then once again here with the same value. So I'm taking my shift value, and I'm using the remainder operator to make it smaller, I guess. And then after I use it uh, to adjust my index, I'm again using this modulus operator over here. I don't even think that is needed. So let's try getting rid of that. 
Let me make sure this works. Okay. I'm about to start breaking stuff. Let's get rid... Well... Let's get rid of this A shift value. Now it's still angry with me because it wants this shift value to exist. Yeah, this still works. So that extra variable was not serving any purpose. And the reason that it wasn't necessary is because I'm already doing this modulus over here. So that, that the remainder operator is already being applied. Okay? Now, I'm not even really, it's not even really clear to me what's going on on line five, but maybe we can try to figure it out. Um, so let's print. Okay, so that seems correct. Let me try a larger value. Ah, okay. So, so this, this, this is where I start to have a problem. Um, so it doesn't look like if I, if I use six, where is this happening here? Um, index plus shift. Yeah, so I, and I think that is where that other modulus was being used, right? Uh, so it, it looks like what's happening here is that, let me get rid of, the rest of this. This is now just going to return. Yeah. So, what's the problem here? Anybody, can anybody see this? This is rotate right. Anybody see what the problem with this is? And again, this was a case where we're never going to give you a negative value. There, there's a mistake here. Anybody see it? No, it's not there. We just did this problem. We did it going left. But now we're going right. And so there's a, there's a small mistake here. Who can see it? Yeah. Yes. I'm not even sure you need this plus text length in here at all. That seems to work better. And now let's see, now I'll put back in this code. That seems to work again. Except that, oh, see now I've got this problem again. So let's go back and look at our, at our solution. So we're, we're adding the rotation, and then we're doing a modulus by the length. So here I'm doing, I'm adding a rotation, and then I'm doing a modulus by the length. And I think now the problem is this if statement. So you can kind of see what I'm doing here, which is I'm basically slowly reducing this to our original solution. But this is an example here about of how several different errors are compounding themselves. So let me, let me go back to the original version of this and show you what those are. So here's what we started with. So let's ignore the part at the bottom. So, it, so this is doing a left shift. It's, it's subtracting. Why is it working? It's working because I've taken the original shift value and I've done this unnecessary modulus with text.length. So what this means is that a right shift of one becomes a left shift of four, which is correct. Like, that's, that, that will work. But now, because I'm doing a left shift, I have to have all this extra machinery in here from lines six through, through ten for handling cases where that might go out of bounds. Um, in, in a way that's, that's much less elegant than what we did before. So again, you can get, so this is, this is a solution. I don't know who wrote this, right? I don't know what the thought process was for getting here. But I think what the thought process was for getting here is a series of small mistakes and then like somebody fiddling with the code to try to fix that mistake, but then ending up with something that by the time you're done is incredibly convoluted, right? Again, I'm doing a left shift inside my loop and I'm making that work by taking the right shift value and converting it to a left shift value. 
But now because I'm doing a left shift, I have to handle cases where the value index goes negative, and, and so, which I wouldn't have had to have, had, I would not have had to handle in the original problem because the original problem never used the negative value. So I've actually made this problem more complicated than it needed to be um, in the process of solving it, right? You know, fun fundamentally, this is wrong, right? And then this mistake compounds itself throughout the rest of the picture. I'm not gonna show you any more of these. I think that's enough pain for one day. Um, instead, what we'll do, let's look at tic-tac-toe. Okay, so you guys did this problem yesterday. Let me pick uh, one that, so let me, I'm, I'm gonna, um, so, so one thing I want to I point out is that when you guys are working on these problems, if something gets really, starts to get really out of control, like, please come and ask for help. Okay, so, so this is code from last semester. Um, and, and again, you know, I don't, don't want to, the goal is not to embarrass anybody. Um, but here is a solution that passed our test suites. This works, okay? Again, it's correct. Some of you didn't solve this problem at all, right? So if you didn't, you shouldn't be giggling, right? <laughs> Serious, right? Like, so, so what is going on here? So, so this is a solution that is literally, to me, I'm not even sure how this works, to be honest. <laughs> but I think what it's doing is it's kind of trying to check every single permutation of indices, right? Um, it's also, so, so here's another, can anyone see another interesting feature of this solution? What's, there's something weird about the loops. How large is a tic-tac-toe board? What's the length of the array that we passed? In the first dimension, three. What's the length of the array in the second dimension? How many times does those, do those loops execute? Once, yeah. So I can actually, I think, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make any changes to this because it's, it's clearly very delicate, so I might break it. Um, but I think I could actually get rid of those loops entirely and just replace all the i's with zero and all the j's with zero. Um, but essentially this is one huge piece of code that's manually checking every possible way that things are going to die, right? Now if you start solving a problem, it, here's the thing. You know, again, like someone wrote this and it worked, right? And they probably worked on it for a while. And I, I really appreciate that. But if you get to a point like this with your code, please come and talk to us. This is not the kind of thing that we would ever ask you to write, right? Even on MP1, some of you are gonna be like, he lied, you know, once you, once you finish MP1, because you're like, some of my code looked like this. No, it didn't have to, right? Um, come and talk to us, uh, we'll help you out, okay. All right, um, again, I'm not gonna do, well, hold on. L let, me, let me do one more of these. Um, it's a little bit, a little bit nicer. Um, this, this one just has a small mistake in it. Or I wouldn't even say this is a mistake. This is just a small, it's just not quite what I would do, right? So this code works. It's correct. Pass the test cases. It's going through the board, and the, the top if statement is essentially doing a check for winners in one direction that's very similar to what we did in class. And then what has added, been added is a check for winners in the other direction. And again, this is, this is nice. It's correct. What, what might you think that I would want someone to do differently about this? Just one thing I would argue might make it a little bit more clear. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the only, and I'll just go and make this tiny little change here. The only change that I would suggest is I would actually do this using two loops. Um, and I would run this one. That's the only, only change I would make. And I, and I think the, the only reason I would do this is because I think this, oh, I've got to indent this a little bit more. I think this makes it a little bit more clear what's happening. So again, this is just clarity, it's just style. You know, so, so why do I think this is a little bit more clear? Because I have one loop 
that's looking for winners in one direction and a second loop that's looking for winners in the other direction. That's it. It's a tiny, tiny little modification. But the original solution to this was quite good. Okay. I am done. We have our first midterm next week. As a reminder, please sign up to take it. If you don't take it next week, there will be no other opportunities. We will have no, hold on, pause. We have no labs as scheduled next week. We will have office hours all day, Tuesday and Wednesday, for you guys to help prepare for the midterm. I'm going to hang out here for 20 minutes or 30 minutes to do a James Scholar interview. If you're interested in doing that, stick around. Um, on Monday, we're going to start talking about object-oriented programming. Good luck on MP1. Have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday.